Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on how to unleash enterprise cost optimization with emerging technologies. I'm Scott Rayburn, and I'll be your host for this insightful journey into all things AIML, RPA, automation, and process optimization. Boy, have we got a great show planned for you today. But before we get into that, let me introduce our topic. According to research from Everest Group that we'll explore more in depth soon, advanced automation, big data analytics, and generative AI are now top five enterprise digital capability priorities for 2024. No doubt this is partly because enterprises can expect to see productivity gains of anywhere from 20 up to 45% in the software development lifecycle thanks to this emerging tech. But many enterprises are facing major roadblocks and gaps to maximize the potential impact of emerging tech for process automation and in turn, reduce their costs and increase revenue. Everest Group sees a lack of vision and planning, gaps in governance, data management, data management challenges, and other blockers coming to the fore here. But adoption at scale is possible with the right investments, both internally and externally, working with strategic partners like DataArt. Today's agenda will cover top enterprise concerns for 2024, the optimization tech ecosystem and proven benefits, and the roadblocks and best practices to overcome them. Then finally, we'll end with those real world examples on generative AI's impact on the enterprise. Okay, enough spoilers. Uh, let's jump in and introduce our speakers. So first we have Mayank Maria, uh, Vice President Everest Group. Throughout the presentation, he'll be sharing this exclusive research on our topic from Everest. How are you today, Mayank? Doing great, Scott. Perfect, thank you. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Yuri Gubin, our Chief Innovation Officer here at DataArt, who will be providing commentary on what he's been seeing on the ground with real clients and what kind of technology investments we're making in this space at DataArt, a leading IT services firm. Yuri, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. And this is a very important topic. I'm excited that we have this webinar and there will be lots and lots of data and insights coming. Perfect, all right, thank you guys. Thanks for being here and thanks to the audience for joining us today. So without further ado, let's kick it off. Um, Maya, do you wanna take it away? Absolutely, and I'm going to be sharing my screen. Let's jump right into the agenda as set by you, Scott, right? So let me touch upon uh, the top enterprise concerns in 2024. So folks, this is really based on a survey that we conduct beginning of every year with leading CXOs, uh, CXOs of leading enterprises, typically Fortune 1000 enterprises, right? So in 2024, we collected responses from nearly 300, 350 enterprise CXOs, right? And we, we uh, tried to gauge, uh, you know, a lot of things from them, right? What are their business priorities? What are the challenges that they foresee, right? Uh, how do they expect their tech spend changing in 2024, so on and so forth, right? And I'm bringing one data point from there for you, right? Which is around the top enterprise challenges in 2024, right? And what we see here, cost and margin pressures, uh, that, that has really emerged as a top challenge across the board. You know, no surprises there really, right? It's really the pessimism that the world walked into 2024 with, right? Carrying all the baggage from 2023 itself, right? The kind of slowdown that we've been seeing that enterprises really want to prioritize costs and margins right now in this environment. Of course, you know, there are other priorities as well, right? They do want to drive growth. They do want to stay agile uh, to adapt to customer needs as well, right? And then the geopolitical tensions as well, they are, they are under attack, right? Uh, but, you know, the, the uh, pedestal for cost and margin that has really increased coming into 2024, right? Really the flavor right now is of doing more with less. And that's also translating into the technology priorities that the enterprises are carrying right now. So, you know, uh, building on the same survey data, right? We asked enterprises on what top technologies would they be investing in, right? Of course, cybersecurity, cloud solutions, they are on the top, right? Cloud, of course, being an enabler to a lot of other technologies and themes as well. But if you see the other three in the top five, right, advanced automation and cognitive, big data analytics, or generative AI, right, all three have a big role to play when it comes to optimizing processes, realizing efficiency, so on and so forth. 
uh, generative AI uh, specifically was a new entrant in 2024. But, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, it also trumped one of the optimization technologies itself. So, you know, in 2023, among the top five, instead of generative AI, we actually had RPA, right? So, I mean, some some movement on optimization technologies, but these technologies are very much on the radar for CXOs. Uh, very quickly on generative AI as well, right? What kind of uh, traction have we seen so far? So no news to anybody that the world has really gone big on generative AI investments, right? And, you know, it's very hearty to see that whatever POCs and experiments the world has done so far, most of those have been uh, productive in some sense, right? So uh, we just saw 8% of the uh, respondents saying that they haven't seen any meaningful impact of generative AI on their businesses uh, yet. Uh, a sizable 25% saying that they've seen fair improvements in productivity, which essentially means that whatever tasks were being done manually, uh, those are being uh, done with greater productivity now, right? So essentially people are able to uh, work better uh, be more efficient, be more accurate with their tasks. And then there is the 67% of respondents who told that, you know what, uh, we are really seeing the processes getting transformed itself, right? Which means that the human intervention in the process itself is getting reduced uh, with the advent of generative AI. Uh, let, let's take it forward a little, right? Uh, let's, let's try and peel this onion a little further on, you know, what the optimization technologies landscape looks like, right? So we, of course, start with RPA, right? And this is a technology that has been there in the world for many, many years now, right? But, you know, it's uh, mostly effective only around structured data, repetitive tasks, right? So in that sense, you know, the kind of complexity that it can deal with, uh, you know, that that's limited, right? Of course, you know, RPA has, RPA has uh, led to significant gains for enterprises, use cases like data extraction, data update, those kind of things enterprises have been able to realize with RPA as well. But I think the real beauty comes in with uh, the advent of AI and now more recently generative AI. And you know something that you notice is that we are saying plus AI and plus generative AI, and this plus you know really means a lot of things. Because you know essentially how we are seeing is that uh, the gains that are to be realized with AI and generative AI, those are incremental on top of RPA, right? Uh, there are folks that we talk to who are mistaken in the way that, you know, uh, if they are to adopt AI and generative AI, right, whatever investments they've made in RPA are probably going to go down the drain, which is not true, right? It's incremental benefits uh, that are to be realized with AI and gen gen uh, generative AI, right? Now, uh, greater optimization possible around more complex tasks, right? Uh, you could also uh, realize automation around unstructured data, right? So uh, use cases like data extraction from unstructured documents, right? More accurate predictions, forecasting. And now more recently with generative AI, uh, realizing aspects like synthetic data generation, right? Information summarization with great accuracy, right? and the conversational uh, interface is becoming much more intuitive, right? So this is a bit of a journey, right? Uh, the bottom line message being RPA and then augmented by AI and generative AI is how we should be seeing the tech landscape for optimization. Now, since we were discussing, you know, uh, this uh, gradient and continuum of technologies and also discussing newer technologies coming in, right? There is also newer ways in which enterprises are taking the initiatives around these optimization technologies, right? So if I look at the bottom layer here, tools and technologies, right? This is something I already talked about, right? We are moving from RPA to now augmentation with AI and generative AI, right? But there are also changes in other layers, as an example, the approach, right? Uh, Enterprises are trying to move from a very siloed approach where any business unit uh, would take their own initiatives around uh, these optimization technologies to now they're trying to establish some processes around these, right? So there is centralization, there is knowledge transfer across BUs. That's what enterprises are trying to get to. And uh, also from the primary focus earlier being around, you know, low hanging fruits, whatever we could get our hands on, let's automate. Today, you know, it's also to uh, 
realize some uh, business benefits beyond costs, right? So how can these technologies impact the top line in some way? Can they enhance my time to market? Can they elevate the customer experience that I'm delivering, right? And in that sense, these becoming C-suite agenda items as well now, right? Uh, being being driven top down in that sense, being a part of the broader digital transformation initiatives of enterprises, right? So th there's a lot of change that we are seeing in this approach, you know, as uh, they are, uh, these technologies are maturing. And you yeah. know, at this point, Yuri, why why don't I invite you, right? Given you've been tracking this industry for so long, right? You've been tracking these technologies, working with clients on them, right? What are some changes that you believe are key in terms of how people are viewing these technologies today versus maybe three or four years ago? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to add that uh, not only it's on it's the C-suite agenda right now, it was elevated to the board level because of the potential okay. of AI and Gen AI and, uh, and uh, automation to disrupt the way how things are done, to do more with less it has a potential to be disruptive in terms of efficiency and uh, productivity to just let people work on something exciting complex new and take the burden of routines out of their way that's why it is now elevated again all the way to the board level and it's a part of the broader strategy of the company development technology development and all the transformation initiatives that you just mentioned I also wanted to say that 2023 was the year of experimentation. Um, many companies, many our clients did POCs, evaluations. Companies invest into R&D a lot just to understand how it works and what is the potential and is there value in it? And now we have so much evidence that there is a there there, not, not only in Gen AI and conventional AI applications and models too. The combination of all three, as you explained on the previous slide, it makes so yeah. much sense that majority of the customers that you uh, talk to, 67%, they explicitly said that, yes, it significantly improves the, the flow and the processes. So this year, what we see, instead of talking about experimentation, all of the ideas are being lined up in a pipeline into a roadmap and every initiative is being structured as a business case so there is a challenge that has to be addressed with gen ai and there is evidence everywhere that something from different fields from different models can be reused or used directly to solve a particular problem we talk about how much we we do it we talk about constraints in terms of time, and we always measure what is the potential value that this thing will generate. And it's not hypothetical anymore. We use examples, we use models, and this is a significant change that it is very prescriptive and focused on the ROI. Yeah, very true, Yuri. I think uh, something that we've been seeing around those lines, right? Maybe I'm repeating your words itself, right? I think 2023 was about enterprises trying to figure out, say, how generative AI could work for them, right? But in 2024, uh, the shift in approach that we are seeing is that they want actually proof points, right? So they are actually asking who has it worked for, right? And they then want to potentially replicate, learn from them, and then get on that journey, right? So yeah, yeah hopefully we will see much more scale-ups around, especially around generative AI and enterprises realizing significant benefits around it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let, let's keep going. Uh, so see, uh, we, we did discuss a few benefits of these optimization technologies here and there. But you know, if I were to put it into buckets, right, they, there are really three buckets, right? The first one being these technologies being uh, implemented to optimize business processes, right? And within business processes, you could think about, say, sales and marketing, you could think about recruitment, supply chain, finance and accounting, so on and so forth, right? And there's a lot of potential that these technologies offer there, right? Then there is a second layer, right, which is around when companies build software, right? How do these technologies feature there and what kind of optimization can these technologies offer around the tech process itself, tech development, tech engineering process itself, right? And then there is this third layer. It, of course, business process and tech process also impacts the customer experience in some way. But in this third layer, what we talk about is 
how can these technologies be used in a way that there are some new product features and product extensions that get defined, right? Which can elevate the experience of any customer using a certain software, right? So uh, the third one, I would say, is still pretty nascent, right? We for sure have seen some use cases of AI, but generative AI-led feature extensions and features enhancements, right? Those it's still early days for those, right? So this is probably something we'll, we'll leave out for another day, another conversation. What we'll focus on today uh, more in detail is on how, what kind of impact these technologies are having on business processes and tech processes. So let me jump into the business processes aspect first, right? Uh, so we, we, we did a quick analysis, right? And I did talk about a few business processes, uh, right? It could be around finance and accounting, HR, supply chain, so on and so forth, right? Cumulatively speaking, if we see the impact of these optimization technologies across verticals, right? There, of course, is a clear winner emerging here, at, at least on the RPA and AI front, right? That's the BFSI vertical, right? And it's really a function of, uh, you know, how, uh, what's the kind of volume of such processes that enterprises in this vertical, these verticals deal with, right? And BFSI vertical really trumps all the other uh, verticals, right? And then there are other factors as well. Uh, so factors like, you know, uh, how much data availability is there, right? How much of the processes actually uh, touch the end customers and hence there is a greater need to optimize those and elevate those. Plus, even a regulatory angle comes in, right, where these technologies are being used to an extent to drive regulatory compliance, making sure that all the processes are by the book and so on, right? And hence, the BFSI vertical is really much ahead when it comes to RPA and AI. The story on generative AI is slightly different, and that's because I think enterprises in every vertical, they are trying to experiment with generative AI today, right? So there is not really uh, so much delta between, say, a VFSI vertical and others when it comes to generative AI. Of course, you know, still early days as uh, things settle, right, as the pilots, as we were talking earlier, they move to production, they scale up. Potentially, we'll have some clear winners coming out on the generative AI front as well. But today, this is how we see the story to be. I also thought, you know, we'll, we'll highlight some use cases, right, of uh, these optimization technologies coming together and you know doing some wonders across verticals right and there are a few highlighted here uh, in no particular order really and this is also not an exhaustive list to be honest right we just thought we we'll give some examples here i'll not go into a lot of detail here maybe i can discuss one of the examples uh, i'll maybe pick the first one which is uh, loan and claim processing in the bfsi vertical right so again, you know, it's it's a combination of all the technologies that come together and they help elevate uh, this entire process of loan and claim processing, right? So starting with say an RPA, which can help with some basic data entry, right? Data validation uh, around you know what whatever the customer is submitting, to say an AI or an AI based uh, chat functionality would come in, which can actually help a customer go through this entire loan or claim uh, filing application, right? There could be questions and the customers just type in answers to those questions and the application gets filled, right? Now, you know, uh, discussing what impact a generative AI could have here, potentially, you know, uh, based on whatever inputs there are, a generative AI could be used to actually produce loan or claim documents which are personalized for a particular customer, right? So in that sense, completing the entire journey and having multiple touch points based on these optimization technologies, which tend to have different kinds of impact. And I think all the other examples as well, you know, we could dissect in the same manner of what impact an RPA AI and a generative AI could have on these processes. But I'll not bore you uh, folks uh, with more detail. Why don't I invite you back in, Yuri? Any examples that you want to really talk about from your customers? where these technologies have uh, come alive around processes. Yeah, of course. So one quick comment on the things that are not Gen AI. Uh, so say it's um, recommendation engines, it's production planning, predictive maintenance. So the, the state of the AI models and the industry is that you don't, 
it's the matter of finding the right model and tool set to get it done. There is very little risk in doing these experiments. Everything depends on data and how mature the organization is, but it is very pragmatic and practical. And uh, with relatively quick and short AI project, uh, a, a very high value projects can be completed. So we have seen this in the past and it just reiterates this here. With Gen AI though, uh, what you mentioned in, in one of the previous slides is that a customer experience, this is something that creates value for organizations, for their co consumers, that it's still, the, the, this thing is still being very actively measured of how it works. What we have seen is that in many cases, the technology that is being created with Gen AI and AI are being deployed with so-called man in the middle. So not necessarily the customer is being exposed to Gen AI, but yeah. the, the customer support personnel will be using Gen AI tools to very quickly process a large number of inquiries and do it in a very productive, personalized way to get all the right context and to do it very, very quickly. So this, we have seen this left and right in all of the different industries that we work with. And one more is, um, there is a you know perception that Gen AI is about generating text, generating images, but when you work with Gen AI projects, you realize that there are techniques like vectorization and and basically the whole architecture of retrieval augmented generation, is that you can use these techniques to build tools, to build pipelines, to automate processes that will not necessarily interact with end users. For yeah. example, da data mining, data mapping. Um, data acquisition. This is where we see elements of technologies associated with Gen AI products only are being used a lot. Makes sense, Yuri. I think, and that uh, you know uh, takes me back to the classic co-pilot conversation that we tend to have, right? So it's essentially assisting humans in doing their jobs better. And as I heard you, right, that's that's the uh, dominant motion that you're seeing right now rather than potentially generative AI being the front for the end customer or the end user, right? Makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense, right? So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I I'm shifting gears a little, Yuri, and I thought I'd also discuss, right, uh, what are our observations when it comes to using some of these optimization technologies for the software engineering process itself, right? Uh, Scott, I think earlier in the uh, introduction you did highlight some of these numbers, right? What kind of productivity is being realized based on some of these optimization technologies, right? These, by the way, are based on uh, real evidence, right? These are not estimates uh, of ours. We've gathered this data from different enterprises and service providers, right? So uh, anywhere between 20 to 45% productivity gains uh, being realized in the software engineering process itself. And, you know, uh, this productivity would again not essentially just be about you know say saving costs uh you know it could be about greater accuracy in code it could be about faster code development and deployment and you know when it comes to software products specifically time to market being so crucial right uh, some of these other productivity measures are also fairly uh, relevant now you know if we see these different layers right of rpa ai and generative ai right you, you see that incrementally the kind of value that is uh, realizable through uh, software engineer uh, through the optimization technologies right from say around rpa it could just be around the automating code deployment to now with generative ai you could get into code generation right again the classic co-pilot uh, the way you know it's it's broadly known in the world which is generative AI assisting developers in uh, developing code faster and code which has greater coverage, higher quality as well, right? Those are the kind of aspects that mm -hmm. we see play out, right? Yeah. Development and testing, of course, uh, much higher than ideation because ideation really requires that human creativity, a lot of research and uh, those kind of elements, right? That's where we are seeing still lower levels of uh, these technologies being used, but dev and testing are really the functions where we are seeing a lot of uh, relevance of these technologies. Yeah, and I'll be very brief on this one. So we've tried multiple different tools to assist our developers. 
um, and we we know for a fact that there are different you know requirements and constraints and everything depends on the project the language the skill set of your developers and on the problems that you're trying to solve perhaps there will be a tool that will dramatically increase the performance of developers but there is a risk that some developers will try it and will just not like it which is also fair so as long as there is ambiguity there is a question so the sooner you get to this question and give it a try and make your own uh, you know judgments and see how it works in your particular project the, the sooner you do it the better yeah makes sense yuri i think uh, the context is fairly important right and the way that you use these technologies in your projects in your context that's going to uh, govern how much productivity you are able to realize So I'm going to shift gears a little, right? Uh, I'm going to get into the next chapter of our discussion for today, right? Essentially, you know, there is a lot of potential as we discussed around these technologies, right? But enterprises, they face a lot of challenges when it comes to realizing the full potential, really, right? And this again is based on different conversations that we've had from time to time, right? Different kinds of challenges that enterprises are facing today when it comes to realizing the true potential of optimization technologies, right? So first and foremost could be, you know, taking the first step wrong, which is, you know, not prioritizing the right use cases. Or, you know, if you even prioritize, you don't have a vision for how the use case scales up, who are the users within your organization who end up benefiting from the use case, right? You are restricted to say your own view, you don't have a firm level vision of scaling up a particular use case, right? That's a big, big challenge. And you know, if you're starting out wrong, of course, you can't realize good value out of whatever you do, right? The second big one is around governance, right? Uh, so this is about, say, measuring the efficacy of a certain use case, right? Seeing what challenges are still remaining unaddressed, right? Having some central practices which are more foundational, say, around what tools and technologies to use, right? How does data get shared across the organization and so on and so forth, right? There is usually lack of clarity around that and that's also a big impediment around scaling up these use cases. The third one, you know, and uh, goes without saying, you know, your initiators will be as good as your data, right? So data centric challenges are very real, right? From data existing in silos to there being concerns about which uh, you can leverage what kind of data, right? To you know, uh, exposing the data to these initiators and then worrying, you know, who is owning the data now, whether the data is being used in an ethical manner and within the regulatory boundaries as well, right? Plus, you know, around data, I think the skill set challenge is also very big, right? There are just so many tools and technologies out there that enterprises are challenged with having the right skill sets for everything. And then there is a whole list of other challenges that we could talk about, right? There could be lack of uh, C-suite buy-in. There could be uh, areas around, you know, just focusing on, say, cost realization, cost benefits, and not looking at other benefits of uh, any investment, right? Which could, again, be an impediment, right? And won't be uh, an exhaustive use case, uh, sorry, a business case in that sense, right? So let, let's uh, quickly discuss, right? And uh, it's it's more some very quick recommendations on how uh, an enterprise can think about addressing each of these, right? So first one around use cases, right? It's really about prioritizing. And what we are uh, suggesting here is uh, a framework to be used to prioritize what use cases or what processes you go after to uh, really implement these technologies, right? So uh, the framework that we've defined has two dimensions. One is what kind of an improvement potential is possible within the process. And this also, you know, this is not one answer for every enterprise, but very contextual in terms of how well have you defined the process, right? What kind of technologies are you already using within the process? And for the process users, what's the kind of experience, what's been their feedback so far, right? And on the other side, it's uh, something that we define as impact potential. So it's really about how crucial is that process or use case for your business overall, right? Could be measured in terms of, say, how many users does the process touch, right? 
uh, how many instances get processed or it could also be around what's the kind of cost that's associated with every instance of uh, processing right so those aspects need to be considered to really uh, identify what use cases fall in the number one zone for you and then going after them full scale right and for those use cases also you know having some quick wins having some quick proof points uh, so that you know you get buying for scale up the other approach right which is really uh, catching up right now is uh, citizen led discovery right so actually getting suggestions and recommendations from the process users on where they really need optimization where are they really challenged instead of it being top down and outside in about you know what the world is doing this and hence let's do that your users really telling you where they need optimization right so that's very important uh, to start out right on this journey now if we talk about governance really right so i mean there is again a continuum here and it uh, scales up with the scale of your organization as well as the scale of the optimization initiatives that you may have within the organization right so think about an organization which maybe has just two or three business units maybe has at max say a dozen of processes that they are trying to optimize right a siloed approach could work right so every business unit could see what works for them where do they need technologies like ai generative ai rpa and they could do their own thing they could track the progress of uh, their these investments on their own right but you know as you as you go uh, as you scale up right if the number of processes that you're touching goes beyond a dozen and the scale of your organization is itself running into multiple bus right you need a centralized approach and something that we also call the coe approach here right where all the best practices right all the uh, standards are set by a certain coe right which is responsible of course for taking inputs from the different views on what the optimization needs are but then centrally responsible for actually making all those investments and also governing the success right evolving those right evangelizing those across the organization right now you know even the centralized approach it could be limiting beyond a certain scale right uh and you know the, the initiatives could go out of control for a certain centralized body to manage right so beyond a certain scale the ideal model to get to is a federated model right so there are some responsibilities which are centralized and there is still a coe that you have but then there are also autonomies provided to different views to experiment to an extent uh, with automation and other technologies to see what kind of benefits they can realize right so uh, as the scale increases and ent uh, enterprise need to think about going from siloed to a more centralized approach and to eventually also go from a centralized approach to a more federated approach as we call it yuri any uh, anything that comes to mind that you would yeah. want to share on um, this think yeah. think about a, a coe or a lab as a uh, as a startup within an enterprise a small cross functional group that quickly iterates learns something does the research and finds answers to questions that what it does yeah but that's very important yuri would you say um in terms of our clients where they fall on the spectrum between siloed and federated approaches I think it's either silent or centralized right now. That's what I expected. I'm sure everybody's after the the right hand side of this thing. Yeah, and I think this is this is more uh, something that we also see just a handful of uh, best in class enterprises who hit certain maturity, getting there, right? But it's a journey, really, right? Uh, you you shouldn't be starting with a federated model at all, right? This is a journey that you need to take around your initiatives. all right uh, let me quickly talk about data right and there are many many issues that we've come across when it comes to being data ready for adopting these technologies right i did touch upon a few could be around data security could be around data access around across the organization it could be and you know i think this is the most uh, acute one which is around having the right skill sets to really get your organization uh, data ready for some of these technologies right and then there could be other uh, concerns as well which could be say around data quality right 
you have data, but you know it's it's uh, biased in the sense and causing hallucinations as you train your AI models based on that data. Right? So th there needs to be a, a very uh, streamlined approach around data, right? You you need to really see where your organization is uh, on your data readiness today, and then see on these different five aspects, right, from skill sets to a use case suitability to you know the tools and technologies that you're using around data. You you need to make some firm decisions, right, which also then need to be very centralized uh, for your firm to follow, right. And lastly, I think a mixed bag of some recommendations that we have, right? How to get exec buy-in, right? You need to identify relevant stakeholders uh, within uh, your organization, right? Uh, preferably senior leaders who can get buy-in from others in the organization as well, right? And you need to equip them, equip them with a solid business uh, case around investing in these technologies, right? Which needs to uh, go across not just direct benefits but also indirect benefits of using these technologies which could be around innovation right customer experience elevated revenue so on and so forth right uh indirect benefits you know some more detail right how could you justify the use case you could use indirect benefits such as uh net promoter score cycle time reduction social media reach so on and so forth right we have some recommendations on TCO and ROI as well, right? Uh, so how do you build the business case? What are some different considerations that you need to have, right? In the business case itself, we are laying some of those out. I will probably not go into the details in the interest of time. And then also around a monitoring mechanism, it's very important that whatever you are investing in, there is a certain mechanism which is periodic to monitor the progress around adoption, around challenges that may be still unaddressed, right? Around what kind of ROI you are deriving on the investments you are making on some of these initiatives, right? So not going into the details, but uh, I think some of these can be used uh, by our audience offline as well as uh, yardsticks to define how they take forward their uh, initiatives around these optimization technologies. Great. Um my uncle, why don't you keep going here? I just wanted to provide a quick show note. Um, Yuri Gubin is not feeling well, um, so he had to drop off. But um, we still have my uncle here and myself to answer any of your questions, and we will finish the presentation. Go ahead. Great. And uh, Scott, this is really the last view that I want to share with the audience, and then I'll probably turn over to you. Right. So, you know, we did discuss about the challenges, right? And what we are seeing is that service provider partners are really uh, rising up to the occasion and helping the enterprises figure a lot of these challenges out, right? They they have uh, they and I mean they are also in the process of building these advisory capabilities where they are able to facilitate decisions around how to prioritize use cases, what technologies are suitable, whether you are ready data wise for a certain investment or not, right? how to uh, set up a governance mechanism, so on and so forth, right? So those kind of advisory supports to start with, but then having scaled talent around different technologies, around different uh, data layers and, you know, data related initiatives as well. That, you know, the service provider world, I believe, you know, they're really doing a commendable job in scaling up talent around all the new tools and technologies, right? So in that sense, staying relevant in the game for the enterprises. And then, you know, also uh, complementing all of that with, you know, their partnership network, they are building some of their own IP and frameworks that come handy for enterprises as they embark on this journey, right? So in that sense, you know, service providers, I really believe, are becoming an indispensable part of this entire puzzle, helping solve a lot of these challenges and helping the enterprises really realize benefits out of uh, the initiatives that enterprises are setting out on. So I'll, I'll pause here, uh, Scott, and uh, I'll probably yeah. invite you in. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, next slide, please. We can uh, jump in. So as they say, the show must go on. Um, anyway, um, that last slide was quite relevant because it talks about the relevance of solution providers such as data art in this ecosystem. Um, if you think of AI as like a gold rush, you know, we're kind of like the picks and shovels of the people on the ground who really can help enterprises digitally transform in this direction. 
Um, and it's because we've been doing this since 1997. Imagine, or just think about how many waves of technology change have come since 1997. You know, we've, we've rode them all and helped customers get into the digital future just over and over again. Um, and now we're much larger than we were back then, over 5,000 people across 30 locations. You know, we've got the scale to support pretty much any transformation project. Um, next slide, please. And our clients are 400 plus um, leading companies across the world. Here you can see some of those logos. And our motto is partners for progress. We're not just here for the short term. Um, we're here for long term transformation, whether that's, you know, back in the day when it started with RPA a few years ago to more traditional AI to now what we're calling generative AI. You know, we can kind of go across this whole landscape with you. Next, please. Our AI lab in particular is, is our investment in this space. Um, this is essentially an internal investment that is available for clients to kind of add value to those engagements. Um, we specialize in NLP, Gen AI, uh, predictive systems, computer vision, model and algorithm development, and of course, data science. And we have some proprietary frameworks that we use as well uh, to get to value faster. Next. We have an AI consulting offering as well um, because AI is more than just technology today. It goes across the whole corporate business. Uh, like Yuri said earlier, uh, starting at the board level, the whole way down to you know, the, the back office personnel. And our framework generally starts with a rapid assessment, goes into strategic development, and then ends with implementation. Um, we actually don't like to get too far ahead of ourselves with this offering uh, because we see technology changing every six to nine months. So when we say roadmap, you know, we, we could aim for five years, but let's be honest, you know, things, things are going to change in that time span. Um, and then next, please. Oh, this is just a nice list of all the, the different solutions we've developed. Um, I think last year we developed over 40 POCs. Um, that number certainly grown in the first half of this year. Um, and what's amazing is over 20 of these have actually been for real clients. Um, and we're, we're kind of on this journey with them and it's, it's beautiful to watch. And um, what I'll do now is actually give you one of those sample client case studies on the next slide, please. So this was for a leading European airport. Um, it's a generative AI chatbot for customer support, and it used a RAG solution accelerator, um, which increased infrastructure development speed by 90%. On the customer side, um, it was just a fantastic experience compared to what they were using before, where these duty managers, um, we're having to manually deal with this overwhelming workload of chats um, leading to delayed response times. Um, that is a just classic case for generative AI chatbot. And um, we did this in partnership with AWS and well, as well. Um, and we can do it with basically any partner, any model, any technology stack. So there you have it. That's just a quick case study. Um, I believe now, uh, we can start with some questions. So please put your questions in the chat. Um, we will you know, go through them as they come through. And to start, I actually have a question of my own. Um, so you know, we focused a lot on where you should deploy AI or process optimization. But I think in the spirit of consulting, which is really the industry that we're in, analyst relations or you know, analysts in general for Everest Group, um, I wanted to focus for a moment, which areas of the business are the worst fit for adopting AI? What processes can't be optimized? You know, where are we having the most trouble? Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Mayak? Yeah, so I think a quick one, Scott, there would be actually uh, areas which, which could be addressed via something very simple as RPA, right? Those getting complicated by uh, 
implementations of AI, right? So essentially areas where AI is not really needed and, uh, you know, the enterprises are actually jumping the bandwagon and trying to see what they can uh, achieve with it, right? So, you know, if the process is fairly structured, right, it's very rule-based, right, there could be, uh, say, say some uh, user interfaces where, right, you know, it's, it's so simple that, you know, a simple Q&A could do the job, but you're trying to, say, bring in a conversational AI agent there, right? Uh, I mean, it, it may just do more harm than good uh, to the entire customer experience that you're going to deliver, right? So I think uh, whatever uh, is doable via RPA shouldn't, shouldn't be subjected to AI really, right? And, you know, uh, I don't think I can generalize it in terms of, you know, which business processes, because there'll be a lot of nuances there. But I think broadly speaking, uh, unnecessary uh, complication with AI is something that any anybody should avoid. Got it. Yeah, it's, it's not a magic bullet. Um... Whether it's solving an actual problem, it may be more complicated than it looks, or there's just some things that are better to be left alone. Absolutely. Okay. Um, any any recommended reading on this topic? Um, we're you know you're you're an analyst firm, right? So you guys actually provide kind of like the the source of truth for this, but where do you actually get your information? Where do you do your reading, Maya? Yeah. So I think uh, a variety of things that we do, Scott, right? Of course, we, we follow the leading companies that are uh, really, you know, uh, at the leading edge of generative AI, right? These could be companies who are, say, building tools for generative AI or, say, the hyperscalers, right, who are building the entire ecosystem, right? Uh, those from there you know also having a lot of conversations with enterprises to understand where are they headed what are the challenges they are uh, challenges they are facing how are they thinking about a technology like ai and generative ai right and then the third thing companies like yourselves right because you guys are not very far from what and how the enterprises are thinking right where are you investing into what kind of use cases are you trying to prioritize in terms of monetization and all of that right so we, you know, as analysts, we try to bring all of that together, package it nicely so that for any reader, right, it becomes more consumable. And we, by the way, have a lot of published research on topics like AI, generative AI, even RPA, right? Uh, we, we've been tracking these topics for many, many years now. Uh, we've uh, partnered with companies like yourselves, right, on initiatives like uh, what we are doing today as well as done some of our own publishing, right, on the topic. So there's a lot of information that uh, we are able to provide on the topic. Yeah, I, I find it so interesting, this holistic, you know, knowledge management and sharing ecosystem. It's so necessary to, to figure this stuff out. Um, but yeah, we have a question from um, someone in the audience. Uh, the question is, curious to hear your view about investment protection for the enterprise. If the enterprise invests in solutions or integrations with Gen AI APIs available now, what is the outlook that this will be able to be a good investment a few years out? Yeah, yeah. See, uh, I mean, it, it depends again on the scale, right, at which you are going to implement generative AI uh, for yourself, right? If, if the scale is not as much, right, it makes a lot of sense to leverage whatever solutions are available via third parties today, right? Especially via, say, the hyperscalers, right? Uh, but, you know, if, if the scale uh, increases, right, the cost of using some of these uh, ready-to-use generative AI packages, right, these could be much higher than, you know, if you were to, say, set out on your own journey, potentially, you know, uh, host something at your own... Uh, uh, in your in your own space right uh, some of this uh, could could be very uh, crucial in making the decision around whether to rely re, uh, rely on these solutions that are available in the market today versus uh, you know some building something of your own right something else that's going to be critical is also you know what kind of conviction does the market have on whatever solution you are going after right that that really will govern you know how relevant or uh, current will the solution continue to be even some years down the line right regular updates right investments into uh, you know fine tuning and all of that right 
how does that play out for a particular solution right so some of these considerations need to be kept in mind while selecting a solution and also while uh, making a decision of say a build versus buy around generative ai yeah i think it's the the timeless question of future proofing is it even possible who can do it um how much do you have to pay for it you know can you hire data art to do it um you know i tend to think yes we can help a lot um but it's it's a challenging one right um but yeah it looks like there's no more questions um so i'd like to thank our speaker today mayank from everest group um yuri who had to leave a little bit early and then of course the audience who did join us live today thank you all very much um if you have any questions uh, perhaps you already went to the QR code before this, um, checked out our contact us page, or you can contact us directly through this email on your screen. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a fantastic day. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care.